obviously Acts chapter 14 verses 8 to 20 you can see the uh, the stress for the lesson today um, in our in, in the booklets uh, that we have and in the introduction basically all what Chaz is doing Chad is doing in the introduction is is bridging the gap between last week's lesson and this week's lesson and so the end of chapter 13 the beginning of verse 14 I'll just read those kind of quick and maybe make a few comments um, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And I think just the, the first thing for me that pops out about that is the, and, and, and really, I think almost everyone in, well, I, I mean, I'm assuming everyone in here, um, but I know a, a bunch of you and know that it's true that you, you long for the word, you want to study it, you want to, you know, as we've been talking about, do the chronological Bibles, look at the parallel translations, I mean, all that kind of stuff, and it's awesome. And that's how the people were um where paul had been and they begged they wanted to hear the word i remember uh back in college um uh, when when i was a student at ohio state university greg was the campus minister here at fishinger and kenny and i would just i would just ask sometimes greg would you explain the trinity again or would you explain um uh grace versus works all of these big giant themes in the bible and those those aren't good examples the Holy Spirit was probably one of them where I would just let me hear it again because I need to hear things a lot <laughs> before they sink in and so and Greg was super patient and he would just do it and he would I mean you know Greg I mean it would be like reading a textbook we'd be um you know wherever we might happen to be usually Buffalo Wild Wings called BW3 back then um but he would just systematically go through the truths from scripture and it just helped so much to hear it again and again and again and that's what these people wanted and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, and this is kind of a common theme when Paul goes through his missionary journeys, uh, the, the ones who weren't converted, um, and sometimes Jewish Christians would cause trouble with the Gentiles, but not usually on these journeys, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. But since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And, and how cool is that? Not cool that the Jews rejected it and they had to, but, but great that the gospel, of course, is available to all, which was God's plan. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, um, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then uh, this was also used in the introduction uh, by Chad Ramsey in the booklet, Ephesians 3. I think he just had 8 and 9, but I'm, I'm going to give you bonus verses 7 through 13. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. And then notice the, uh, you could put a one here, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and two, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. And these things, I would say, are parallel. I would say to preach to the Gentiles and to bring light for everyone would be you know, two ways of saying really the same thing. Uh, unsearchable riches parallel with mystery hidden for ages of Christ parallel within God, uh, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Uh, so often the passages that talk about not losing heart or staying strong in the Lord, to put it in the positive way, are, are right after or right with comments about suffering 
uh, turmoil and things like that. And here we have that same thing. Paul is just expressing to the church uh, there in Ephesus that, you know, all these wonderful, amazing blessings, these great truths that are being thrust at them. And so don't lose heart, uh, even though I'm suffering a little bit. Um, but don't lose heart, uh, because all these great things are true. And of course, Paul, he, he did not mind being uh, not the suffering servant like Christ, but being one of his suffering servants. And he did not mind that at all. In Philippians, he said, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and I want to share in his sufferings. And uh, Paul certainly uh, had to. Um, and so they get kind of thrown out of Antioch and Pisidia, and, um, and they head down to Iconium first, and uh, right here. And then head to Lystra, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but first, as they're getting there, uh, chapter uh, 14, uh, verses 1 to 7. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And this is uh, one of the themes brought out uh, in the booklet, that they were able to do signs and wonders. And these things were done, of course, to, uh, to show that what they were speaking was true, to show that it was from God. And this was something, of course, that was taking place in the first century as the gospel was spreading. And, um, and we see that happening uh, in, this, in today's lesson as well. Uh, but the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of, like a no, I can't even say it, uh, like Canonia, that's not right, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So they weren't going to be hindered. And uh, of course, we're going to see Paul left for dead uh, today, but they don't stop. I mean, they just keep going. They keep going, keep uh, praising God, keep declaring the gospel. So the first thing we have in our text for tonight is one of these signs and wonders. A, a cripple is healed in the first uh, three verses here of our, of our text for today. So Acts 14, 8 through 10. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Now we have other people who were crippled, uh, who were healed. This one and I, I think it's cool, and I think it's, it's noteworthy uh, that, that we have in the booklet, the idea that this, this guy had faith. And the other ones, uh, some, sometimes when Jesus did healings, the people had faith. Sometimes they didn't. Same thing with the apostles. Sometimes people had faith, and sometimes they did not. Uh, but in this case, um, Paul saw that he had faith to be made well. And so he said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And immediately he sprang up and began walking. And I think just absolutely incredible. And I don't know if this was, I don't think necessarily it was a miraculous thing that Paul saw that he had faith to be made well. He might've just noted the guy, you know, any of us who have taught a class, uh, no matter what church or school or wherever, we, you know, you know when someone's engaged, you know when they are, when they're kind of feeling it and, and uh, responding to it, you can, you can see it in their eyes. And it could have just been something like that, or it could have been a miraculous, I mean, obviously the healing was miraculous, but it could be miraculous as well that Paul was able to see that and know that um, uh, beyond a doubt, uh, but we don't know that. And we just know that it, it just says here, Paul was looking intently at him and, uh, and saw that he had faith to be made well. And that's, that's awesome. And again, not that we expect the apostles not to respond to opportunities, but Paul, of course, was willing to immediately, you know, grab hold of this opportunity with this man who had been uh, crippled uh, from birth. 
And we do have the Hebrews passage that kind of relates back to uh, verse 5, I think it was, here in this chapter. Um, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So this was exactly what God had in mind. This was the way in which things were going to spread. Um, and Paul and the other apostles, of course, uh, but in our uh, quarter here, Paul in the book of Acts, we're going to be seeing Paul. Paul, of course, took advantage of the opportunities to provide these signs and wonders. Yeah, go ahead, George. This is not like the miracles you see on TV today, because I mean, when I lost use of my left arm back in August, I'm still going to physical therapy today to get it to work right. And he took, he, he didn't have to go to physical therapy. You know, it was instantaneous. Uh, it's, you know, that's pretty big. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that, I mean, you've got the miracle of healing with all these different ones that we have throughout Scripture. But there's, there's a miracle, not only the healing, but the miracle of the... Uh, the recovery of the atrophy of the, you know, if someone hasn't walked since birth, you know, you know, those leg muscles aren't in good shape, but these people, whether it was Jesus or Paul in these, in these miracles, this is not just the healing, but the, but the total restoration of the person's ability to do whatever it might be. Uh, the seeing uh, the, again, the, the, the legs um, just being, you know, these people jumped up, carried their mat and went home, whatever they did, just absolutely, you know, phenomenal. It was a, it was a, re it truly was a restoration. It was a, uh, you know, again, God doesn't do things halfway. He isn't gonna, you know, when, when God does it, especially in these miraculous ways back uh, in the first century, you know, it was full and complete and, and, and amazing. I mean, the, the people back then would have had enough knowledge if they sprained an ankle, if they hurt, dislocated a shoulder, you know, they would have known it takes time for these muscles to get back to normal. And so they would have realized, you know, this is truly a, not that they would have not suspected it just from them being able to get up, but truly a work of God that was complete um, and, and whole. And that gets us to the, you know, the idea, that's what God wants for us eternally. He wants to take us from where we're at and make us whole again. And that can only happen in Christ. And from a spiritual standpoint, of course, that means our sins being forgiven and us being granted uh, the blessings of being in Christ. So quite, quite phenomenal. God always wants people to have wholeness. We've said it before. We'll say it again. When the Jews say shalom in New York City, even today, they mean may your life be whole. May it be complete. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we have here. This guy was made whole uh, in, his, in his legs, at the very least. So very, very, very good. All right. Um, so the next section, uh, and this is our longest section for today. Um, this is where the, the people uh, determined that Paul and Barnabas are gods. <laughs> and this would not have been an unusual thing. We know Herod the Great considered, you know, he didn't care when people considered him divine. And, you know, when people were able to do amazing things like they just saw Paul do, this was kind of, at least in the pagan world and uh, in the Gentile world, this would have been a natural reaction. Of course, Paul and Barnabas are appalled by this. They, they tear their clothes. They, they show all the, uh, the, the outward signs of being grieved. And, of course, they were grieved by this. Uh, they did not want the people to uh, elevate them in this way. Similar to the angel in Revelation, a couple times John wanted to bow down and worship, and the angel, no, 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 you know, only God, only, you know, only the Father, Son, or Spirit, only God, and uh, not, not an angel, not another man, and this is a, this is, you know, 
something very, very consistent uh, in Scripture. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying, oh boy, I should have read these things out loud. I can't, I'm going to get this word again. Um, Lycaonian um, saying in that language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Of course, the only incarnation was Christ, but they're, they're not aware of this yet. Uh, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So, I mean, obviously, you know, over the top, wild here, um, response to, I mean, and it's awesome. And, and, and Paul, he, he said it with a loud voice. I mean, he wanted people to know the sign took place. You know, he wouldn't have had to say it with the loud voice that he did. He wanted this to be a sign that would cause people to believe uh, but obviously they went they went to a place that that he and Barnabas were not um, were not you know that was not right so therefore they were not comfortable with it and wanted and, and needed to correct it and did but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out men why are you doing these things we also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. And this, this gives us a little foretaste. I don't know if Luke did that on purpose, but a little foretaste of, of Paul in Athens um, when he talks about the unknown God and, and moves them to uh, the God who is alive, uh, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. So, I mean, just wow. I mean, the people, they, and maybe, you know, maybe even today there's something in a person that wants uh, something physical, something that can be seen, something that can be touched um, to worship. And maybe that's why people turn to uh, pleasure or material things or, or um, turn to whatever it is that someone might elevate uh, to, a, to an inappropriately uh, high level. But, but here we have Paul and Barnabas trying to, to confront these people and stop them. Uh, from worshiping them, from offering sacrifices to them. And notice the the idea of like nature. Um, uh, of course, of course, we you know we don't read this and have any question about the nature of Barnabas and Paul. Uh, we know when we read about Christ, you know, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We 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 know true things about Christ. He was human, but he was also divine. You know, his nature was definitely. Again, we, we say fully human, fully divine, and I don't think that's incorrect at all. But, you know, there, it's a little messier when we look at Christ, but we don't look at this and think anything about Paul and Barnabas, except they're human beings just like us. But these people looked at them, thought they were Zeus and Hermes, and, and put them into a different nature, a divine nature. Um, but they point, and again, this is pointing out that there are the different natures, but Paul and Barnabas, the same as all these people of Lystra, uh, no doubt about it. Paul goes into detail on this in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, when he's talking about the resurrected body, he talks about how, you know, birds have one kind of flesh, fish have another. Uh, you know, the, there are these different kinds. There's different glory. There's the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars. Um, and each thing has its own, but there's consistency. If you plant uh, an acorn, you're going to get an oak tree. If you plant, um, if you plant grapes, you're going to get grapes. If you plant an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree. And so he says is the same with the nature of our resurrected body. What is planted, our physical bodies, what is planted is mortal. What rises up will be immortal. What is planted is, um, what are some of the words there? Uh, planted uh, corrupt raised in glory, planted weak, raised in power, and then planted physical, 
but raised spiritually. So he, he goes into this nature thing. And when, when we're resurrected someday, obviously our nature will change from all those things, all those first things to all those second things. But there is a consistency there. But we're not going to turn into gods um, is really what I'm getting at. Not that any of you in the room <laughs> were suspecting that. But he wants these people to know the main point for him in saying this is we are men like you. There's no difference. And then, then notice with the, the teachers in the New Testament, and of course with Christ as well, that let's turn our attention to the real God. It's not us. There's a true and living God. And I want to move you to that from these vain things that you're doing. We bring you good news, the gospel. And uh, talks about God providing blessings, uh, the rain, fruitful seed, you know, providing these things for all people. Um, and in saying in verse 16, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. He's saying, well, you know what? Now things have changed. Now Christ is for all, not just for the Jews, not just salvation for the Jews, but now for all people. And, um, but again, verse 18, they didn't, they didn't want to stop. Um, People, and really we're looking at kind of a, we're, we're looking at kind of a mob mentality. Um, of course, we know people think differently when they get emotional in a group. Uh, the Bay of Pigs is the classic example. Um, after the fact, not one person in the room agreed with the decision being made, but they all thought everyone agreed. And so they all made the decision together, even though not one person afterwards when interviewed agreed with the decision. So I don't know what, who I, mean, I don't know how many people were in the room, 20, 18, 12, whatever it was. You know, there's a, there's a group mentality. It's hard for people to, it's hard for people to change course in a group like that. And uh, so anyway, here, I think we have the same thing. They just, they, they wanted to offer sacrifices to Zeus and Hermes. And here they are in the flesh. And it was hard for them to, uh, to stop. So um we have verses uh, 19 and 20 still to go, but any comments at this point before we uh, move on? Okay. Oh, oh go ahead, George. Or, or Don. And one of the distinctive things you see in Acts mm -hmm. is the Christians are able to go against the group mentality. You know, Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. Um, so you've got a new power in Christianity, or you're supposed to have a new power in Christianity to break that trend that the flesh takes you to. Yeah, that, that that's that's great. That's a great observation, um, and that and that's true. And we do see it over and over again. That that's fabulous. And hopefully, hopefully we do the same thing. Hopefully we don't get caught up. Um, in what you know unless we're with each other <laughs> yeah, then it's fine uh, but hopefully you know we don't get caught up in you know greg greg talks about he does he does a i mean he goes around the nation and speaks about the 10 trends of facing the church um it was in the i, I forget how it was worded but he kind of had to change the title because now we're in the year 2020 and he's, he's modified the 10 trends but there are trends, and, and Phil Sanders wrote a book years ago called Adrift, and people just kind of going with the flow. And, and you're right, George, we've been given the power to resist that and to, to stand firm on, on the groundwork of Christ. So, yeah, really, really neat. And we see great examples of that uh, in the New Testament, like you said. We're going to, hey, you know what? We're going to obey God <laughs> rather than you guys. It says it right to their face. I mean, it's it's very very impressive uh, what we see uh, with God's people. And so anyway, very cool. Great. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we just have. To, uh, I've got some other verses um, after this, and we got the the discussion questions and stuff. But let's look at these two verses. We have the stoning, and then then um, this is a good lesson for all of us. If you ever get, if if you are ever stoned, it's good to leave. It's good to get out of town. So stoning and departure not not a bad plan um so the jews came from antioch and iconium so remember the map at the beginning of class you know antioch iconium and lystra they're they're right together they're it they would be like um you know i don't know hilliard and dublin i mean just just right near each other um antioch though 
you know, that, that's a little bit of a trek, uh, especially in their days. And so, you know, the, the people from Antioch, you know, they did get riled up from those Jews. Um, well, and th those Jews came. So the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds and what a transition. I think Chad um, in the booklet compared this to the people, you know, praising Jesus on uh, Palm Sunday, you know, he's coming through, Hosanna, Hosanna, laying palm leaves down in the street, Jesus is coming in on the colt. I mean, just unbelievable. And then they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Although I'm not sure it's the same crowd. I don't know exactly what those mock trials, but still what a contrast to go from Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. And here we have the people wanting to sacrifice to them. And then boom, they persuaded the crowds and they stoned Paul. It wasn't just yelling out, stone him, stone him. It was, you know, they did it. They stoned him, dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. So, I mean, unbelievable. And, and Paul really, when he goes through uh, near the end of Acts or in some of his letters, all the things he went through, I mean, wow. I mean, he really did. I think our last, I've got my outlines over there. Yeah, our, our last class on August 30th uh, for this quarter is shipwrecked. So, I mean, you know, Paul just, uh, you know, he, you know, Jesus said, um, that this guy's going to suffer for me. Um, and, and boy, did he, uh, he sure did, but he, he, he took it, um, he took it as a, as a Christian should, um, again, not seeking it out, but handled it well, um, and, and here as well. In verse 20, we're not told, um, here that a miracle was done. Um, it, it just says that they supposed that he was dead. We don't know that he really was dead. Um, he was, um, as in Princess Bride, he was probably at least mostly dead. <laughs> but uh, anyway, when the disciples gathered about him, and maybe there was something that happened there, um, maybe it was not miraculous, so to speak, but because of their prayers, or maybe there was a miracle that took place. Uh, again, we don't know. But he, but he rose up, um, entered the city. You know, it seems like he was definitely revived in a, in a very great way. Uh, from his injuries, uh, and on the next day, he went with, on with Barnabas to Derby. So, um, let me go, yeah, the, the um, I, I have two quotes here, um, and they're from the booklet, so you, you've got them if you have the booklet, but uh, uh, McGarvey says about this, the same circumstance which had given him the inferior place in their idolatry gave him finally the superior place in their hatred. So, I mean, just unbelievable, again, the, the the twist that the people did. And then Chad, who wrote the book, he ends this section by saying, thankfully, his work was not done, talking about Paul. Uh, the attempts to stop the spread of the gospel failed again. Christ must be preached. And I liked that just because it's, it's true for us today. We may be hindered. Things may happen. You know, we may have our setbacks as far as sharing the gospel with maybe a family member or a friend or whoever it might be. You know, we're, we're going to have those setbacks. We're going to have times where it doesn't go so smoothly, where things aren't so great. But you know what? God provides the increase. We just need to keep throwing the seed down on the path, keep spreading the gospel, and, um, and, and it'll happen. You know, that people may want to stop it, uh, but the harder people push to stop the spread of the gospel, usually the more it grows. Uh, there's, there's a truth in the, uh, the statement about martyrs causing the church to grow, and um, I forget how it's nicely worded, but, um, but that seems to be true. Uh, when the church comes under persecution, it tends to, uh, the, the people of real faith tend to come out and, and uh, make, it, make it strong again, so. All right, so um, uh, again, any, any comments here before I uh, read the couple applications? Okay, let's read those, and then if you have any comments about them, that, that's great. Um, uh, miracles were performed to confirm the Word of God. We've kind of talked about that already. Those who performed the miracles did not take credit for the signs that transpired, and that's, that was even true with Christ, and he was the Son of God. He always turned his truths and preaching and miracles 
to the glory of God. And that's what people would do. So we don't always know how Jesus did that exactly, how he got them to focus on God Almighty, but he did. He was able to do that. We're told they were amazed and they glorified God. It never, it never says they were amazed and glorified Christ um, when Christ actually did it. Um, and and the, the Christ followers were able to do the same thing as we see here. Uh, instead, they correctly pointed others to the God who empowered them. When the multitude in Lystra attempted to worship Paul and Barnabas, the evangelist gave all credit to God and described how he revealed himself to man in such a way that allows man to choose to serve him or to refrain uh, from doing so. And then the second one, uh, Paul's response to persecution is encouraging. When he met opposition, he did not stop preaching. Instead, he and Barnabas went elsewhere and continued sharing the message. Even when he was stoned, he didn't stop. Instead, he traveled to Derby and continued to share the gospel. We must not allow personal criticisms or attacks to divert our efforts. And then he says again, uh, Christ must be preached. And that's, that's true. Um, the, uh, there, there are the questions just to see if you read the text. And then there are always the discussion ones. I'll just throw them up on the screen and, um, and see if any of you have anything you want to add. It doesn't have to do with, it doesn't have to be about these discussion questions. But any questions, any comments um, as we uh, come near the close tonight? Okay, well, uh, we can we can chat after the uh, Ron. I'm going to ask you to lead a closing prayer, if you will. Um, glad to have you uh, in here. And oh, let me. I forgot. I put the, the the end of the chat. Let me go ahead and do that real quick, and then Ron, you can pray after that. Um, these are the last um, uh, verses of the chapter. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra. And this is the on the map of the missionary journey. They go back through. You can see the on the on the map I've been using the blue area, blue and red arrows showing the they get to their end point and then they start heading back. They return to Lystra and to Iconium and then up to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. So they went back through to, to encourage, um, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Antioch of Pisidia, or at least through Pisidia, and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia, and from there sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. That's a common way of wording things with Luke, uh, both in the gospel and in Acts. Uh, they remained, he didn't say they remained a long time, they remained no little time with the disciples. He does that a lot, and I think it's uh, it's neat. But this, that ends the first missionary journey, so that's that, uh, this closes out that. They're back in Antioch, the original Antioch, and uh, have completed that uh, circuit. So uh, go ahead, Ron, if you will. Thank you. Sure. God, we thank you for this uh, time that we could be together to uh, study your word and just thank you for uh, the blessings you give us and that you've been with us through uh, these difficulties and, and uh, has, have kept us healthy. We just pray that you would continue to uh, guide us through this uh, troublesome time. We just uh, pray that uh, this virus will dissipate. Treatments can be found to... Uh, uh, cure or reduce its effect. God, we long to be back together again as your church, and we thank you that we're able to get together in some measure, but we do pray that, uh, again, that this virus would subside, and uh, we, again, we can find cures that would allow us to be back together again. God, we just pray for this uh, country and the, the difficulties that are going on in our country. Pray for peace, for understanding. Um, we just pray that uh, people would seek you at this time. God, we just thank you for the opportunity we have um, through these mediums of, of, uh, of electronic ministry here and in our Bible study and our worship. And we just thank you that we're able to use these tools to uh, reach people who just for one reason or another just cannot uh, come together. Be with us uh, as we enter a new week here and pray that uh, those who can can come together tomorrow to worship you uh, together and uh, continue to, to be with us throughout the rest of this week. It's for your son's name we pray. Amen.